All right, guys, welcome to the class on Moshe Rabbeinu, on Moses. Wednesday night, Thursday, as we were saying, is the birthday of the great Moses, great Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm going to call him Moshe during this class, and we'll see why, the power of his name. Uh, Moshe was born in 1393 BCE, which is 2368 in the English calendar. And 120 years later, on that very day, Zion Adar, this Wednesday night, Thursday, which also coincides with my birthday, so I am very uh, feel a connection to Moshe's birthday and what it means. On that day, he was born and passed away 120 years later, the seventh day of Adar. And we know that righteous people are will be born and pass away on the same day sometimes, that that's an indicative of their greatness. Moshe was born to Amram and Yocheved. Now, it's my, my, when, um, when my parents moved from South Africa to, to America, the, uh, my, my mother went to a class uh, by Rabbi Benzion Kravitz called Jews for Judaism. It was like, you know, if missionaries try to convert you, what do you understand about your own religion? And one of the first questions he asked was, who knows the names of the parents of Jesus? So I, my mom's like, that's easy. And then he said, okay, now who knows the names of the parents of Moses, of Moshe? And my mom was like, I have no idea. And that's a hard one, right? So it's Amram and Yocheved. And when my mother learned that, she's like, I need to learn more about my own, my own religion, my own heritage. Uh, and she was kind of embarrassed by it. So she started learning more. And that was, that's what led our family more into, into Judaism. But Amram was the leader of the tribe of Levi, the third son of Yaakov. And Yocheved was actually the daughter of Levi. So that's his parents. And then Moses' two siblings, Aharon and Miriam were both prophets. So it was an illustrious, amazing family. And we know that when next week, when we celebrate Purim, the holiday of Purim, Haman, Haman, when he did a lottery, Purim means lottery, means a raffle. Haman did a raffle lottery. He won, we're going to talk next week in a class about Purim, why it's called or after a lottery. But a raffle means nothing is planned by God. Everything is just random. And when it fell on the month of Adar, I guess Haman found a little meaning in that, not just randomness. He said the month of Adar is when Moses passed away. The great leader of the Jews died in this month. This is an auspicious month. But little did he know that it was also the day that Moshe was born. And actually, his Brit Milah, his circumcision would have been on Purim itself. But they say he was born circumcised. He was born with a light coming from him. He was, he was holy from birth. And Pharaoh's astrologers, Paro's astrologers, they saw in the stars, they saw in the future that there was going to be a redeemer born, a male redeemer born um, soon. So that's why Pharaoh made it a decree to wipe out all male children. Some say even Egyptian ones as well. And they were thrown in the river. But we know the story that Yocheved, when Moshe was born, she placed him in a basket and put him in the river Nile. And when he was placed there, the astrologers saw that the redeemer had been thrown, had been put in the river. And they believed that he had been killed, that, that finally the decree was over and that there was no reason to kill baby boys anymore. And we know what actually happened was that Moshe was saved, that Moshe was put in a basket and Miriam, his sister, followed along. And Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, of Paro, was bathing now with her servants. Now, why was she bathing? So there's different, different commentaries. One commentary says that she was actually converting to Judaism, that she was joining the Hebrew nation. And we know that when you join uh, Judaism, you dip in a mikvah, you dip in a body of water. And that's why she was going down to the water. And when she sees the basket of Moshe, she has pity on, on, on this baby. And she reaches out with her arm and she pulls him in. And when she takes him out of the water, out of the basket, that's where he gets his name from, right? Because the name Moshe comes from Meshi Sihu, which means to be drawn from a place, drawn from the water. And maybe that's connected to the month of Adar, which is the idea of Pisces, the idea of the fish of, of the water. And 
And Batya, his mother, the not mother, but but the daughter of Pharaoh, who's his adopted mother, adopted mother. Batya means daughter of God, and that could be a name she took on when she joined the Jewish people. And Moshe, though, however, what's interesting is that he had many names. Like his father-in-law, Yitro, he had many names. Some say he had, I think, seven names. And one of them was Shmaya, which means from heaven. He had a lot of great names. So how can we call him by the name of Batya, the name that Batya gave him? So one of the reasons is that Batya risked her life to really save this Hebrew child. She had courage and conviction to do the right thing. And that's something that really carried on with Moshe throughout his life, something that he really embodied and represented him well. And that's one of the reasons we say that we kept the name in the Torah that Batya gave him. But he refuses to be nursed by any of the Egyptian women. So Miriam suggests that let her find a Hebrew woman to uh, raise him for the first few years. And that's what Yocheved, his real mother, is able to get Moshe back and is able to nurse him and teach him from a young age about his Jewish roots uh, before he's given back to Batya. So Moshe grows up in the palace, in Pharaoh's palace. And one of the things we see later in his life is that Moshe has a speech impediment. And he tells God, how, am I, how can I be your messenger? I can't speak well. And where did the speech impediment come from? So the Midrash, when I say Midrash, I'm talking about an old ancient collection of teachings. That's part of Jewish tradition of what's the story behind the story? What's really going on behind the scenes of the Torah stories? And in the Midrash, it says that as a baby, as a child, Moshe uh, one time grabbed Paros, the Pharaoh's crown, his golden crown. And the whole court was, including Pharaoh, was a bit startled by that. Like, what's this random orphan child that's part of grabbing my crown? So actually, they say he had three advisors, Job, the famous Job, Eov, uh, Yitro, who later became the father-in-law of Moshe, and Bilam, the, the wicked Bilam. And by the way, when he said, Let, let's enslave the Jewish people, Bilam said, do it. Yitro said, don't do it. Job stayed silent. And some say that's what led to all the travails that he had later in his life. But none of them give advice to Paro. It's actually the angel Gavriel, says the Midrash, that came and said, no, 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 don't punish the child or get worried about him. Why don't you put him up to a test? So they put him up to a test. They put a, a flame, a coal in front of him, like a, gold, like a very shining hot coal and gold. Which one would he grab for? And if he grabbed for the gold, that was a bad sign for him. So Moshe, the baby, the child went to grab the gold and the angel pushed his hand to the coal and he grabbed the coal and put it on his mouth. And that's what burnt his tongue and gave him a speech impediment. However, according to Hasidic thought, according to mystical teachings, the reason why he had a speech impediment was not a physical speech impediment per se, but it was indicative of his, the challenge he had in his life of trying to communicate his, his, the depth of his mind and his heart with people that were not on his level. It's very difficult to, to communicate what's in your mind and heart to another, how much more so for Moshe, who's on such a high level, that it says he had a speech impediment. He had a difficulty in, in and he had that his whole life. The people demanded meat. He said, I can't give these people meat. I don't even understand what they're bothering me about. Like, I don't, I don't get where they're coming from sometimes. So Moshe was very lofty. The the um, as he grows up, he's walking outside the palace and famously he sees an Egyptian guard beating a Hebrew man mercilessly. And the Torah says that he looked both ways. He looked right and left and he killed the Egyptian and he was buried in the sand. What does it mean he looked both ways? So one of the interpretations isn't that he looked both ways like to see if he'd get in trouble. It means he looked in the future and he saw that this Egyptian taskmaster didn't have any righteous descendants coming from him. Besides the fact that he was beating this person potentially to death and therefore Moshe had to step in. In addition, he also made sure that there was nothing in the future um, to, to hold in his merit. And there's a whole explanation of why he was beating the Hebrew and why he deserved it. Um, but he uses the name of God to strike him down and the earth like hides him, like he's able to easily bury him in the sand. And because of that, 
because the sand kind of hides his, his transgression from the Egyptian uh, royalty, he doesn't perform the plague of lice because you have to strike the ground. And out of appreciation and gratitude, he couldn't do that plague, Aaron did that plague, as well as the plague of the frogs and the plague of the blood because the water, when he was in a basket, carried him along the Nile. So he also had to show appreciation to the Nile, which is an amazing lesson that in Judaism, showing appreciation and gratitude even to inanimate matter, like on Shabbat, Friday night, we cover the challah because usually you're supposed to give a blessing on the bread first, but because we do it on the wine on Shabbat, we cover the bread to almost show respect to the bread, to cover it. So in Ju Judaism, we're saying if, if you have to act this way to bread, to water, to earth, how much more so to fellow human beings that we need to show sensitivity, appreciation, gratitude. Another thing that I learned from this action of killing the Egyptian was a lot of times when you get into like a spiritual practice, you believe kind of the Eastern path of pacifism, like I can never get angry. I can never, you know, stand for justice if it means being uh, aggressive in some way, because the path of a spiritual person is to be, you know, turn the other cheek. And I think Moshe shows us that, no, that don't box yourself in. It's not about being spiritual. Life is about truth. Life is about justice. Life is about doing the right thing. So generally that is through being patient, through being soft, through being sensitive, through being a spiritual person. But Moshe shows us that if you need to step in, uh, if you're, uh, you know, I saw, I saw in Ukraine, there was a Jewish guy with a long beard and a kippah with a, with a huge gun going to war. Is that a spiritual path? Yes. That is the path of, of truth, of protecting. If you're not tough against evil, then evil will flourish. And it's an interesting, it's just an interesting topic. I, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything against anyone else's belief system, but, and I have to look this up because I've just heard it, but I heard that Gandhi said something about during the Holocaust that the Jews shouldn't fight back, kind of should just let nature take its course and be, be show peace and you'll receive, you know, peace in return. And I don't think that was the path. It worked against the British with uh, Gandhi's path, but I don't think that would have worked for the Jewish people. So it's just an interesting uh, example of Moshe being just a multifaceted person. After he does that, the next, very next day, he sees two, two Hebrew people fighting. They were known as Datan and Aviram, very rebellious troublemakers in the Jewish community. And when he sees them fighting, he says, wicked ones, why are you fighting? And they said, what, are you going to tell on us? Are you going to, are you going to hurt us? Are you going to kill us like you did to that Egyptian? And when Moshe hears that, he says, oh, now the matter has become known. And he didn't just mean the matter has become known like, oh gosh, everybody knows what I did yesterday. The deeper explanation is that he said, now, now I understand what I couldn't understand before is why the Jewish people are going through suffering. And now I can see that there's a lot of like character traits that need to be fixed up in our people, that there's things we need to work on. And maybe that's also part of why we're going through suffering. Now the matter became known to him and Moshe is captured and brought to the palace. And the Midrash says that he was sentenced to death. And as the, the, the executioner put the sword against his neck, his neck became stone and he ran away. He ran away from Egypt, he escaped. And after this, by the way, in the Torah, you don't hear anything really much between now and the next stage of his life. But the Midrash has a, at length an incredible story about what happened in Moshe's life. That Moshe, um, some say he went to Ethiopia and Bilam, the wicked Bilam, had created a uh, army um, of like magicians, of, of, of black magic. And they had taken over the, the, uh, the country or, or an area of the land. And for nine years, Moshe battled and was eventually victorious uh, in Ethiopia. And he was actually appointed the king of Ethiopia for 40 years. So when he escapes Egypt, he's like in his 30s, 20s, 40s, around there. And when we later hear from him uh, at the burning bush, he's 80. So in between, we don't, we don't have in the Torah what happened. But according to the Midrash, he had a quite an eventful uh, life in between. And it says that he married the daughter of the king of Ethiopia. Um, but he could, he, he, he refused to be intimate um, with her. And she kind of complained about this like so-called husband. And in the end, he had, he had so much favor in the kingdom 
that, you know, they did nothing to him, but he had to divorce. He had to leave uh, the castle because the, the king's brother and son, the wife believed should be leaders. And it just kind of worked out that way. And he was deposed and he left Ethiopia and went to Midian, which I believe is to the east of Israel. And in Midian, he goes to a well. And it seems to be, if anybody's looking to get married, go to your nearest well. I don't know what it is about wells, but Jacob, Yaakov, uh, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, Moshe, everybody seems to find their soulmate at the well. So maybe today they should make like a dating app called The Well or something like that. Um, but he goes to a well. And at the well, um, the, the daughters of a man named Yitro, who we mentioned earlier, Yitro, Yitro, Yitro was considered... Um, one of the greatest kind of mystics of his time. He tried every religion, it says. He tried every belief system. And um, Yitro, at that point, had given up on idol worship. He had finally come to like a conclusion that this was not the path. And because of that, he was deposed. He was uh, lowered from his high status in the community. And that's why his daughters, when they come to the well to get water for their sheep, the shepherds try to chase them away. And Moshe steps in and protects them and gets them water. And they come to their father and tell them about this, this, this man. And he says, bring him, bring him back. And he ends up giving his daughter Tzipora to marry Moshe. So that kind of concludes the first major segment of Moshe's life before we really get into the, uh, the, next, the next step. What we really know Moshe to be. So take a quick sip. Okay. So Moshe becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law and he is walking with the sheep one day and one of his sheep runs away from him and he chases after the sheep. Finally, after a great distance, the sheep goes to uh, some water and starts drinking. And Moshe says, oh, I didn't know you were thirsty. And he, and he takes the sheep onto his shoulders and carries the sheep towards the flock, his flock. And, and, the mid and it says that God saw this and God said, if this person is so compassionate to sheep, this is the one I want to shepherd my people, to shepherd my sheep, my flock. I can entrust him with my flock. And at that moment, Moshe sees the burning bush. He sees this thorn bush in flames. But as it's burning, it's not withering. It's not being consumed. It's just burning and staying as is. And Moshe says these words. He says, let me, asura mikan, let me turn away from here and let me go to there. Then the verse says, God saw that Moshe turned to look. And he said, take off your shoes for this place is holy. So a lot of questions here. Why would God reveal himself in a thorn bush on fire? Why is it so great that Moshe turned to look? Like, I think I would look too if I saw anything on fire, but how much more so something that's burning but not being consumed, like a miracle, I'd want to look. And why take off your shoes because the place is holy? Like a lot of questions here. And there's some incredible, some of the most amazing insights into life uh, from this episode. First of all, why did God, first of all, why was Moshe uh, rewarded or why was God so impressed by the fact that he went to look? The idea is, why does it say I'm turning from here and going to there? Just say, I'm going to go see what's going on. Moshe was saying, Moshe was realizing that by witnessing this miracle, by being shown this thing, Moshe had reached a level in his life of work that he understood that right now I have the opportunity to experience something far greater than I ever have before. This could be a life-changing thing. This is a step in this direction if I choose to take it, that I'll be forever changed. It's an adventure I will go on, right? The hero's journey. And Moshe says, I will leave from here and go to there. I am willing to take from where I am to go to a completely new place, a new reality. And God said, you know what? You're willing to take that, that risk to pursue truth. God was impressed by that. And God says, take off your shoes. The word for off your feet, take your shoes off your feet. The word for feet, for heel is regel, for leg is regel. Regel 
is connected to ragil. Ragil in Hebrew means normal, normalcy. And in English, the word regular is likely connected to ragil because every language is connected back to Hebrew. So God say, take your shoes off your feet can also mean take off from yourself regularity, normalcy. You're now going to enter. All that you knew to be normal is not going to be anymore. It's almost like every movie we watch is like this, where the hero is like living his life like Matrix Neo, and then he's given this opportunity to choose. Do you want to take the red pill or not? And, and that's one element of this story, that the idea of chasing truth, no matter what uh, uncertainty it can bring to you, it, uh, it approaches you with. And number two is a beautiful idea of why did God reveal in a thorn bush on flames? And it's told that God was revealing to Moshe why the Jews were suffering in Egypt. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why must there be a thorn bush, a, a painful experience on fire, and yet know that the Jewish people, even though we're going to suffer throughout history, and many will suffer throughout history, but we're going to suffer in history, we're even going to be on flames, we will never be consumed like the bush. We will go through pain, but we will never be defeated. And, and, uh, and Moshe, it says, what did he do? He turned his face away. He didn't look. And the idea is that Moshe said, I don't want to know. You want to give me the secret of all secrets, something we all want to understand of why bad things happen? To see it from God's perspective, Moshe said, I don't want to see it from your perspective, God, because if I do, then in the future, when bad things are happening to the Jewish people, and I want to defend them and, and uh, pray to you on their behalf fully with my full feeling, once I see behind the curtain, once I understand the meaning of why it's happening, I won't be able to do it properly. There's a story, I don't know if it's a Maggid of Mesrach, but one of the great Hasidic Rebbes a few hundred years ago that one of the tzaddikim, there was, there was a decree against people. I don't know if it was a drought or it was like a, the, the government was being very tough on their community. And they were praying that God should answer them. And, they were, and, and one of them had a dream. And their, rab, their Rebbe, their rabbi was in, who had already passed away, appeared to him in his dream. And he said, Rebbe, why aren't you, why aren't you interceding on high and getting, getting us to be redeemed, uh, 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 helping us and saving us from this awful situation? And he said, because from where I'm looking, I don't see bad. That in the higher realms, seeing it from above to below, instead of from our vantage point, surface level from below to above, he didn't see bad. You know, a child that walks into an, uh, an open body surgery in a hospital will think the doctors are killing the patient because his mind cannot fathom more than its le level, five-year-old level. How much more so between us and God, us and the higher realms. And Moshe said, as amazing as it would be to see a glimpse of that, I prefer to be a true leader of my people, to really represent them fully as a human. And God says, take off your shoes. This place is holy. Because when it comes to difficulty in people's lives, when it comes to pain, when it comes to the Holocaust, when it comes to all of this, in Judaism, we believe this is sacred territory. We don't enter this topic flippantly, frivolously. No, it's all meant to be. It's fine. No. Even though we know there's a reason behind everything, have some respect, have some humility, and, and understand that this is something sacred that we don't really understand it's trying to understand God on his level and connecting to God on his level, on his terms, not on our terms. It's a very deep subject, the subject of pain and challenge, but there is a reason. That's why when God says, what name should I tell the people of the God that's sending me? God says, now I'm not going to say it's with, it's, it's, it's with a Y, not with a K, but because it's God's name, I'm going to say, Eke Asher Eke meaning I will be that which I will be. I will be the same God that's with them in good times and bad times. And in Egypt is the same one that's with them in all the challenges throughout history. And what does Moshe do when, he, when God reveals himself to him and says, go, go save the people? He says, I don't know. I'm not the one for the job. For a week, they argue. And the idea is that not Moshe wasn't scared or you know, didn't feel up to the challenge. Moshe said, send the final redeemer. Moshe saw what do you mean? I am, I'm the God. I will be that which I will be. I will be the same God now as I'll be through all the exiles in the future. Moshe said, I don't want any more exiles. Send the final redeemer. Let, let somebody else be the final 
redemption. And Hashem says, no, Hashem gets, gets a bit disgruntled with Moshe and says, go, go and go and save the people. Don't question me so much. And Moshe is known as the Raya Mehemna, the faithful shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd feeds and gives drink and grass and, and, and to his flock. A, a Raya Mehemna, a true leader of our people, is one that feeds and sustains us with faith. A faithful shepherd, one that's literally nurturing us. You see this amongst the righteous of the past. You know, if you watch videos of the Rebbe, for example, you you read the writings of Rebbe Nachman, you you get you get nourished spiritually. That's what they give us. They're, they're almost like our spiritual shepherds, and they're giving us and sustaining us with what we need. I'm seeing some of the comments here. Darren, absolutely. You know, uh, arguing with God or, or, you know, Moshe shows us kind of like when Jacob wrestles with the angel, the symbolism is that we can, we can discuss things with God, we can argue, and we also have to have that faith. Um, but Moshe, Moshe represents a true leader. And I, I, I'm not going to say uh, Zelensky in Ukraine and, and Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, but the idea of, of sacrificing yourself for your people is a given in the Torah. So it's nice to see a little semblance of that today. And one of the other reasons Moshe doesn't want to be chosen as the leader is that he wants his brother Aaron to have the honor. His older brother Aaron, he believes, is the one who should be the, the leader and take saving the Jewish people. And God says, you know what? Fine. Aaron, Aaron will speak for you. He will be your mouthpiece to, to Pharaoh. And what's fascinating is that if you think about it, that shouldn't be allowed. Everywhere throughout Tanakh, the prophet is the one who must give over his prophecy. If you've been granted a prophecy, it's up to you to give over the prophecy. You can't give it over to somebody else. So how could it possibly be that Moshe could get a prophecy from God and give that over to Aaron? But if you look at the language, it's beautiful. The Torah says, uh, the Aaron, it says, Moses, you will be like a god to Aaron, and Aaron will be your prophet. What do you mean your prophet? Moshe wasn't just a prophet. He was on such a level that it was like he was the prophecy himself. So, Every other prophet throughout history used to get a vision or a, or a riddle or a, uh, a inspiration from God when, during a dream or while in like a prophetic state where like totally blasting off in meditation to a higher realm. And then he would have to interpret what he's seeing and give that over in his language. Moshe, it says, according to Kabbalah, was an aspaklaria hameira. He was like a fully transparent glass where God fully could channel what he wanted to give over to the world through him. There was no static. There was no jumbling of his own opinion. So when Moshe gave over the prophecy to Aaron to give over, it was as clear as if Aaron was having a prophecy himself. Moshe was on the level of the prophecy itself. He didn't have to interpret it or anything. God spoke to Moshe while Moshe was awake, fully like I'm conscious with you right now. Moshe was conscious speaking to God didn't have to be in some meditative state in some unbelief. He was always at that level. And that's why the final of the five books of the Torah, the, the book of, of Devarim, it says uh, that many times in throughout the Torah, it says God spoke to Moses saying X, Y, and Z. By Adabar Hashem Moshe Lemor. In Devarim, in Deuteronomy, Moses, Moshe is speaking as if it's coming from God. So you'll say like, Venasati Asif, I will give you a rain in its proper time. It's like, excuse me? Because Moshe, is God, it says, according to the sages, Hashem medaberes mitoch grono shel Moshe. God spoke through the throat of Moshe. So Moshe was a clear conduit. And you, you see this with the forefathers, right? Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. There's called the seven faithful shepherds, right? They're also shepherds in a way. They, you know, they're called a Merkava. They're called a chariot. What is a chariot? Or today would be like a car or a horse. It's something you ride. It's something you take with you. It doesn't have its own existence in a way. 
separate existence. Moshe was smart, probably funny, every, all the character traits of, of an amazing human, but he was nullified to God's will. And therefore he was a, um, like a chariot, like a car for God to ride his will into the world. There's some beautiful stories about this. We have time later to talk about where um, we see this amongst other tzaddikim, this idea of not having any ego or any, a total kind of transparent conduit for God's will. And that's really our mission, right? I mean, we might not be able to get to the level of Moshe, or maybe we will, but we want to become a vessel, right? We can't say, you know, God, give me this, give me that. God wants to give us blessing. God wants to wants us to fulfill our purpose in the world. But, but the light can only come if the vessel is full. We want to, not full, but the vessel is clear. The more we can become humble and, and pure and uh, open, to a higher truth and, and working on ourselves and clear cleansing our vessel, clearing out all the, all the negativity and all the just base core stuff of 2022, everything in our lives, getting it out, the more we become a vessel for God to shine through until such an extent that when you looked at the face of a holy person, you saw God in there, you were able to see their divine soul shined. And because their divine self shined, that's a glimpse into God himself. And you're able to People would look in the eye. There's a guy in Los Angeles that we know that he was a, he was a drug addict and he uh, he went to get a dollar. The Rebbe would give out a dollar on Sundays for people to give to charity just for a second. The Rebbe didn't even speak to him. He just looked into his blue eyes and he changed his life around. And what does that mean? What does it mean I looked into his eye? The eyes are the windows to the soul. The eyes, ayin is mayan, which means a wellspring. A wellspring is a water that comes from beneath the earth that you're looking into, into the being and into that being of the Rebbe was pure godliness, was the soul. And therefore, when he saw the truth, when he saw that kind of higher reality, it stoked within him his higher reality, his soul. And this is, this is for a whole nother class. But when you tap into your higher self, which we rarely access on a day-to-day -day basis, then you can fix anything in your life. You're not limited by anything. All the limitations you say that I'm lazy, I'm addicted, I'm this, I'm that, is your surface level reality. But you have a level of you that's untainted, that's transcendent, that's infinite. And if you can tap into that, you can fix everything else. You can reach a higher place. And that's the level Moshe was living on 24-7. Now, when the Torah is given on Mount Sinai, when the Jewish people fast, fast forwarding, uh, to getting out of Egypt and Moshe performs the plagues and they go out. Moshe goes up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, three times, 120 days and nights. And he received the oral Torah, right? The Torah to write down didn't take that long, but all the laws and all the, the, the understanding of Judaism that we know in the Torah today was received from God during those 120 days. And it says he didn't even eat or drink. When he was up there, min uh, hagamakom, the the custom of the place where you live is what you're supposed to follow. And just like when the angels visited Abraham, it says they actually ate and drank. So the opposite. When Moshe went up to Shemaim, he didn't eat or drink. He was sustained through Torah, through spirituality. And the angels protested and said, "God, why are you giving such a holy thing to these people, these humans that mess up so much?" And Moshe answered, "Do you have parents to honor?" Do you have a temptation to rob people? Do you have the ability to put on tefillin or light Shabbat candles? They said, no. So he said, and God said, you have defended your position well, that the Torah was given ultimately for physical beings to do physical holy things. And the angels are told to bless Moshe, to give him spiritual gifts. And actually it is said that the Satan, the Satan, gave Moshe uh, an insight into the secrets of incense, of the power of incense. And he, he used that later to stop a plague um, by lighting incense in the right method. And we know that later when um, Moshe returns too late, one day it's, it appeared late, the Jewish people thought he was gone. And therefore they, they built the golden calf, which is a whole interesting explanation of why they did that. But Moshe breaks the tablets. And in the last verse of the Torah, it says that was the, one of the greatest things Moshe did was breaking the tablets. And you think, well, what's so great about breaking God's tablets? It seems to be a very chutzpah thing to do. 
So the idea is that the tablets were like a marriage document between Jew Jewish people and God. Mount Sinai, we got married. This was proof of the marriage and the Jewish people had been unfaithful. And by breaking the tablets, Moshe was saying, we're not technically married yet. Yeah, the Jewish people messed up. but We haven't fully consumed the marriage, consummated the marriage. And therefore, he went back up. The Jewish people did Teshuvah. They returned. Moshe got a second set of tablets and the marriage took place. And when Moshe is trying to defend the Jewish people, he says, if you will not forgive them, then mechenina, erase me from this book, from the Torah, which was very painful for Moshe because he, he was the five books of Moses. He is the Torah. And he said, erase me. It's about, about the people being forgiven. And even though God did indeed forgive the Jewish people, a righteous person's words are always have an effect. And Moshe's name was erased from the Torah portion of Tetzave. However, the sages say that that's really where you see the essence of Moshe. Because a name is how you are expressed in the world. But the you, there's a you that, your soul that transcends your name, that reaches higher than the way you outwardly express your mission in the world. And that's the level Moshe reached through his self-sacrifice for his people. When Moshe goes up to ask forgiveness, God teaches him the 13 attributes of mercy and, and shows him his glory, whatever that means, for another time. And from then on, Moshe's face shined. He had to actually wear a veil over his face. Nobody could look at his face. Except when he spoke God's word to the people, he would take off the veil and then put it back. And actually, that's where the the super the um, the myth of Jews having horns comes from, because the word in Hebrew it says that Moshe had horns of light, carne or carne can mean horns, but it meant he had shining horns of light. He had light coming from him. And in English, that's a problem with English compared to the original Hebrew. Some people took that. So you can go to some places in America today. They might ask me to remove my kippah to see if there's horns over there. And when we talk about Moshe being the greatest prophet that ever lived, what's fascinating is the Torah says Moshe was also the, the most humble person to have ever lived. Now, I understand being humble to a degree. You know, you see a celebrity, you see Tom Brady, or you see Leonardo DiCaprio, or you see Vladimir Putin, or you see somebody who's famous, powerful, successful. If they're even a little bit humble, you'd be impressed. But to be the greatest and then the most humble person to ever live, how's that possible? And the answer is that they both go together. By the way, before I give the full answer, I have a couple answers. Katya or Sarah, anybody want to give your opinion of why you think, how you could be both? How could you be both the greatest in prophecy and in character and also be the most thinking that you're thinking littlest of yourself at the same time? If anybody wants to type an answer, you can do that too. I think with greatness also comes humility. And so that probably kind of gets in the way of, you know, really thinking too much of yourself, but also thinking too little and finding a balance between the two. Okay. So first of all, you, you're saying like, like the fact he's called great is actually because he was humble, meaning that's what makes him so great. But um, how, how do you see that it goes together per se? Because maybe like being humble means that you're open to like learning from others and, and growing and, you know, knowing when you need to fix something maybe or. Because I, I think the best of the leaders know that they are still, you know, they're still learning. They're, they're, they've never really attained like the greatest level. You know, they, they know that there's still more to learn. And so maybe there's humility in that as well, you know, um, mm. leader. Right. And yeah. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I see some comments here that say that um, when you're humble, it, it means that you will work harder on your craft. You're somebody who's never like satisfied with, with where you're at. Um, you have year at Hashem, you have, you have um, awe of God because you're not so full of yourself, right? It says that God says, I, I cannot dwell within one who is haughty, one who is got ego there's no space for me there but i've loved this question because it 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 brings up some amazing some very like 
insightful guidance for our life. So one answer is that Moshe was not a fool. Moshe did not delude himself. Moshe knew exactly how great he was. If you were to ask Moshe, are you the greatest prophet that ever lived? I.e., are you the most, like the highest level? He's like, yes, I wrote in the Torah that no prophet will ever arise like Moshe. Actually, I think that was after he passed away, but the Torah attests to his greatness. He knew. Moshe's writing in the Torah that he was the most humble person. He's writing it. So humility is not thinking little of yourself. It's thinking of yourself. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's humility is knowing your greatness, but understanding that it's a gift from above. That most of it, look, great people, successful people work really, really, really hard. It's not enough to be talented. They all work really hard, almost all of them harder than the rest. And they'll probably tell you that the hard work is even more important than the talent. However, without the talent, they probably wouldn't have gotten there. And you actually see a lot of athletes that show that when they score a touchdown or they thank God, they know that one wrong turn and they could tear their ACL and be out of sports forever. So it's knowing that all that you have is a gift and you could argue even your drive, that's greater drive and work ethic is also a gift. The question of life is not what you have ever, no matter what level you are. It's what did you do with your gifts? What did you do with the gifts you were given? That is the question of life. Not how much do you have? There was a student of uh, Reb Mendel Futterfoss that uh, he wasn't a good learner. He couldn't learn Torah well. And Reb Mendel took a cup and he took a huge pitcher of water and he poured into the cup until the cup was full. And now the pitcher had a bit less and the cup was full. And he said, which one is more full? Not which one has more, which one is more full? And the, and the student said the cup, he said, exactly. It's not about how big you are and how much you have and how much intelligence and how much, what did you fill up your cup? Did you do the best you could with the tools you had? Some of us, some people are born with rage, maybe because of what's done to them, maybe innately their care. And maybe their life goal is to not beat someone up to oblivion and just to scream at people or just to boil with rage his whole life. It sounds like a very morbid scenario, but that is more impressive than somebody who's very polite, but just mean to people quietly, even though they could do much better. It's what you are, where you're at, are you doing the best you can with the tools you have? Have you lived up to your potential? So that's answer number one of why he was humble. Moshe said, yeah, I'm amazing. But maybe God, if he gave these gifts to another soul, that soul would have done even more with these gifts. I've been given so much, such a lofty soul. He was born with light coming. From, he, he was given, his brothers and sister were prophets. He was given revelation from God. He didn't have to deal. Okay, so we're going to get to the other actually point next. Number two, very simple answer why he was the most humble. You know why he was the greatest and the most humble at the same time? Because they go together. He had the most awareness of God. He had the most highest level of divine awareness. And <laughs> the reason we have ego is because we don't pay, we don't notice God. But if you were as the more aware you are of how everything is one with the infinite, Moses was on such a level of understanding the power and the immense presence of this infinite being that he was the most humble because he was the most aware. The more aware you are, the more you realize how you're just a glimmer of the infinite light. And that's why Moshe was the most humble, because he was the greatest, because he reached the highest level of awareness. And number three, third reason is a beautiful reason. When later on, Moshe and Aaron, they strike the rock, thinking that that's how they were going to get water from it. And God says the miracle would have been if you didn't strike the rock, and therefore you guys cannot enter the land of Israel. And God says, however, Moshe, I will allow you to, before you die, you can ascend the mountain of Har Nevo. By the way, it's called Har Nevo, Nun Beit Vav. Nun Bo, Nun means 50. Bo means in it, that Moshe, there's an idea in Kabbalah that there are 50 gates of understanding that a human can access. And Moshe only reached 49. 
But right before he died, God gave him a glimpse of the 50th gate of understanding, the final place. And that's why it says Har Navo, the mountain of 50 that's in it, because Moshe reached that 50th level. God says, I will let you see a glimpse of the land of Israel. You can't enter, but you can see it. And when he shows him Israel, he also shows Moshe a glimpse of all of the future to come, all of history to come. God gives Moshe a glimpse of the future time. And one of the reasons they say that Moshe was so humble was that Moshe saw the final generation before the coming of Mashiach. He saw the final generation before the redemption, with which the Rebbe says is our generation. That's us. Moshe saw you. And when he saw the amount of difficulties and the concealment of God and the physicality and the, the, the challenges that we would have, spiritually and yet we would still stay loyal to the faith we would still be trying to grow trying to learn trying to do our best whereas moshe lived with the clouds of glory he saw god all the time he was eating my food from heaven he was ascending up to the highest realms he was having visions of the great he was looking at the glory of god he was experiencing in the desert the most unbelievable things 10 plagues miracles splitting of the sea moshe saw us walking down the street netflix and uh, and uh, and and the Las Vegas Strip and what we what we what revelation we have and he said you're still connected he was humbled. That's what humbled Moshe. Very powerful. Lest you think like oh what am I? Yeah maybe maybe we're 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 tiny beings on the shoulders of giants but we are like Noah. It says Noah was righteous in his time because his time was so difficult, was so low, was so base that Noah was considered extra special because of his generation was just so, so wicked. Okay, we're coming down now to the end of Moshe's life. And there's actually a Midrash called Midrash Petirat Moshe. If you ever get the book called Our Heritage Says by Rabbi Eliyahu Kito, which is an amazing three-part series, I highly recommend it. He has at the beginning of Adar, the month of Adar, this whole section of the last day of Moshe's life. And to me, it's arguably the most moving, inspiring um, stuff I've ever read. And I'm going to read to you, I'm going to read to you um, what it says there about the last moments of Moshe's life when he ascended the mountain. It says, at that hour, Moshe arose and sanctified himself like the Srafim angels. And God came down from the highest heavens to take away the soul of Moshe. And with him were three ministering angels, Michael, Gabriel, and Zagzagel. I'm going to use the Hebrew name. Michael laid out his bed. Gabriel spread out a fine linen cloth at the head and Zagzagel one at his feet. And Michael stood at one side and Gabriel on the other side. And God said, Moshe, close your eyes. And Moshe did so. And God said, place your hands on your chest. And he did so. He said, place your feet together. And he did so. At that moment, God called to the soul of Moshe and said to her, my daughter, I have assigned you 120 years in Moshe's body. Now the time has come for you to depart. Emerge and do not delay. She responded back, master of the universe. I know that you are the master of all spirits and all souls. You created me and placed me in Moshe's body for 120 years. And now is there a body in this world purer than that of Moshe? I know I know that you are, uh, she, uh, the soul says, I love him and I do not wish to depart from him. And Hashem replied, emerge and I shall take you up to the highest of heavens and seat you beneath the throne of my glory, near the Kruvim and the Srafim. God then took Moshe's soul with a kiss. And that's the end of Moshe's physical life. 
And the commentaries, the sages say that dying by the kiss of God means that your soul gets such a level of revelation of God, of yearning, of a desire to connect and become one, such a love that your soul just leaves um, expiration naturally. And they liken it to taking an eyelash from milk with your finger. It's a smooth, seamless transition, which happened to Aaron as well. And I believe Ben Azai and the Gemara. And that is the life of Moshe, one that we can take a lot of um, inspiration from and guidance from. And maybe we always like to close with a short meditation. Maybe just close your eyes for a moment. And I, I've, I've had this, not vision, I've had this, I've imagined this before. It's come to me, this, this feeling where Moshe was never allowed to enter the land of Israel. So I want us all right now, let's just take two deep breaths in, in through your nose, and out through your mouth. Another deep breath in, and out. And just relax your body for a moment. And I want you to imagine the time of redemption, the time of Mashiach, where we'll be at, the, if you, any of you have been to the Western Wall, you can imagine the entire nation, everyone at the Western Wall miraculously fitting there. The new temple, the third temple is built. There's rejoicing like we can't imagine, dancing. And then we turn and we look and we see Moshe Rabbeinu. We see our beloved leader, Moses, walking towards us. Light shining from him. And what Moshe must be feeling, how much he sacrificed, how much pain he went through, how many trials and tribulations and self-sacrifice. He sees us and we see him. Tears of joy run down his face. And he joins our dance. Let's take a moment now in these last stages of exile to think how can we embody the example of Moshe in our life? How can we be more a seeker of whatever adventure we must take to serve Hashem, a relentless pursuer of truth and wisdom and learning, standing up for the right cause, having self-sacrifice, protecting your people. And may we all be reunited with Moshe again soon and with Mashiach and the redemption. as true vessels for Hashem speedily in our days. Thank you to all who joined. If there's any questions or anything to add, feel free.